Good morning. It is lovely to see all of your faces this morning. Happy Sunday. Uh, we're going to stand in worship in just a moment. Also, I want to welcome anyone who's watching online. We're so glad you're able to join us through that means this morning. I want to pray for us, and then we'll stand in worship. Father, thank you so much for your love, for all the ways that you love us. It is our joy to honor you, Lord, and to worship you. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would fill this room with your presence through our worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can stand. <laughs>
Amen.
seated. Let's continue in this spirit of worship and come before God together in prayer. Father, we call you Father and you call us sons and daughters. You call us your children. And you, our Heavenly Father, as we sang, have not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, as you are in our midst, as you are in our hearts, where there is anxiety, where there is distress, where there is fear, I pray, God, that you would wash those dynamics away and replace them with what you give to us which is peace that passes all understanding. God, you give us confidence through knowing who we are and whose we are, that we are yours. We belong to you. God, what a gift it is to be able to worship you together 
as your people, to have this experience of the family that Jesus has called us into. It's not a perfect family. We are messy and broken. But you are in our midst and you are whole. You are holy. And you are working in us, restoring us, making us new, healing us. Restoring our understanding of who we are as human beings made in your image, created for the good work which you have prepared in advance for us to do. God, we just grab hold of all these truths and we claim them as our own. You give us the permission to do so. We cling to you, God. We cling to you in those times that are turbulent and we cling to you in those times that are calm. We cling to you for you are the only sure foundation in life. You are the rock that we are to build our house upon. You are our strong tower. God, you are a mighty fortress. You are trustworthy and true. You are full of goodness and mercy, life, and love. Teach us this morning afresh, O God, what it means to walk in your ways, to walk in the way of Jesus, to look to him, and to learn from him, and what it means to live life abundant, life to the full. God, in this moment, we reject the false and empty promises of the world, that success and wealth, achievement are where true joy is found and we receive, rather, your truths which are eternal. The joy is found in you. Joy is found in life lived in relationship with you, our true father, our true home. And so guide us through the remainder of this morning as we worship through song, through prayer, through meditation on your word, through fellowship. Guide us through all these paths that are before us so that we might depart from this place with a clearer understanding of what it means to walk in the way of Jesus in this world today. For your glory, that the world around us might see who you are through our lives reflecting your light, your grace, and your goodness. And God is with great joy and thanksgiving that we pray together as your people the way Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Great to see you all this morning and welcome to the First Church of Christ in Wethersfield. It is a gift, as always, to be able to gather with you in this time of worship. A few announcements to share this morning from our life together as a people. Uh, First and foremost, if you'd be so kind as to take a moment to sign the friendship register that's in your row and pass it along to those near you. Uh, It's just our way of keeping track of who's here, and uh, if you have any prayer requests, you're welcome to write those down in the comments section, and we'll lift you up in prayer this week. At some point in the near future, we'll be ready to release uh, Amplify, which is our new church software that'll have an app associated with it. We'll have this wonderful, I hope smooth, transition to uh, a new way of tracking attendance and communicating with one another, but for now, we're going to keep things uh, simple and classic with our friendship register. So if you'd be so kind as to sign that, that'd be great. Uh, A few other announcements. This Thursday, April 18th, is our next uh, monthly men's ministry gathering. Guys get together for a time of pizza, uh, fellowship, prayer, learning. Uh, It's a great opportunity to meet other guys in the church. So if you're free this Thursday, men, uh, 6.30, uh, we meet in the lower level of this building. So just two floors down from where we are right now. Uh, You don't need to sign up in advance. Um, Just show up and uh, we'll just have multiplying pizza that will feed everybody. So it'll be great. Uh, Next announcement, our next new member class is happening next Sunday, April 21st. There's still time to sign up. 
Um, even if you're not sure about becoming a member, you're welcome to come and attend. It's a simple opportunity to learn a little bit more about First Church, who we are, some of our core values, our uh, statement of faith, a little bit about our history and what it means to connect at a deeper level in this congregation. So to sign up, uh, you would simply, um, you can go to the firstchurch.org website slash events, or you can contact Marilyn Danielson, who's my assistant, and she's keeping track of who's going to be there. We'll have a simple lunch together, and then just a couple hours of conversation, a chance to ask any questions you might have. Um, so we'd love to have you join us. If you don't, uh, aren't able to make it this coming Sunday, that's something you're interested in, we will have another new member class in the fall. So that'll be our next one. Uh, next announcement uh, for ladies, beginning April 24th is our next wave of uh, the daytime Bible study gathering, a book in a mug. Uh, meets on Wednesdays from 10.30 to 11.45 in the church parlor, which is the floor just below us at the moment. Um, to sign up, Diane Galloway is the facilitator of that gathering, so you'd contact her. Uh, there's info on the church website, or you can send an email directly to her at care at firstchurch.org. This next wave, they're going to be uh, going through a book on prayer by a man named Daniel Henderson. It's wonderful material, um, and I highly encourage you ladies, if you're available for that time slot, to, to join in. From what I gather, I'm only invited to the lunch at the end, but from what I gather, it's an awesome time of learning, growth, and fellowship. Uh, next slide, if you would. Uh, coming up on Saturday, April 27th, uh, one of the women's ministries of our church, the uh, First Women on First Fridays is hosting uh, a, a tea in honor of Lucinda, Lucinda Cindy McDowell, uh, who many of you know was a longtime member and just gifted teacher, uh, had a profound ministry that touched not only our lives, but uh, the lives of people around the world. And uh, we just love and cherish the time we had with Cindy and continue to cherish the memories we have of her. And so on the 27th, here in Keith Jones Hall from 11.30 to 2, there's going to be a tea. Uh, tickets are for sale downstairs in the fellowship area after this service, and then we'll be on sale next week as well. I believe it's $10 uh, per ticket. Uh, so if you're interested in joining, that's going to be a wonderful gathering for ladies. And then finally, uh, this month we are lifting up Kevin and Maureen Kimball. Uh, who serve with Crew. We've been supporting Kevin and Maureen for many, many years. They've worked in New Hampshire on college campuses, uh, but are now placed in Central Asia in a location that uh, we're not able to announce publicly. Um, but we continue to support them both financially and through our prayers. Just as an aside, if you didn't know, First Church, we give 10% of our annual operating expenses to missions, uh, both local and abroad. So we support some local organizations here in Hartford and Connecticut, and then have a number of missionaries throughout the world that we support in partnership uh, with other churches in Connecticut. So Kevin and Maureen are among those. So this month uh, of April, please keep Kevin and Maureen in your prayers. Sure, Josh has a bonus, bonus uh, announcement. There we go, okay, bonus announcement. I didn't, this didn't happen in time to get it in the announcements and the handout and everything, but VBC registration is open for kids and for volunteers on uh, firstchurch.org slash events. The same page where all the other announcements were. You can go on there and register for that. So. Sweet, that'll be $10 for that bonus announcement payable to me. <laughs> <clears throat> it's the price if you don't get them in on time. Let's take a moment to greet one another and then the worship team will call us back into a time of worship in a few moments.
Is it? Probably from my guitar. Be seated. Thank you, worship team. I'm especially impressed by Eric this morning playing the bass while simultaneously keeping father's eyes on his kid who was roving across the front. 
That is, uh, that is next level parenting, Eric. I was impressed with you before, but now, man, you're just firing on all cylinders, man. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you all. Happy allergy season, by the way. <clears throat> I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I'm glad I have two water bottles because I think I'm going to plow through both of them as we go, go through the message today. Who's suffering from allergies right now? Go ahead, raise your hand. All right, literally everyone. Okay. We're going to have some prayer for deliverance from allergies after the service. Just come forward and God is going to do something, I pray. It's unfortunate that allergy season coincides with the most beautiful seasons. Like, I feel like allergy season should be in the dead of winter when no one wants to go outside and experience beauty, but it's like, oh, let me create these beautiful trees and also you're allergic to them. So you can maybe see them through your squinted, crying eyes, but probably not. I don't know. God does have a sense of humor. Uh, but great to be with you all. This uh, com- the coming months, we're going to be um, journeying through the book of Ephesians. And the series is titled The New Family of Jesus. So we're looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians through this very specific lens of the new family of Jesus. I get a lot of suggestions on what I should preach on. Feel free to keep them coming. I may say yes, I may say no, but many people have asked, could you preach through a book of the Bible? So I was happy to oblige, and here we are uh, with Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the new family of Jesus. Family is complicated, am I right? (laughs) All right, so we all have allergies, we all agree that family is complicated, good. We are one people united in Christ. Uh, For some of us, family is a place of safety and refuge. Uh, We have those quintessential family experiences where we gather around the table for Sunday supper and good smells are wafting in from the kitchen and there's laughter and joy in the dining room. And we do everything we can to maintain those experiences. We fight for them tooth and nail. But for many others, the experience of family is not that way for people. For others, perhaps uh, you're included in this lot today. Uh, Family has been a place of pain or disappointment or rejection, or possibly even abuse. Like I said, family is complicated. And even those families that seem to be idyllic on the exterior, it's most likely that they have complications going on under the surface. I think that tends to be the trend. Either way, our families mark us. They are arguably the most influential source in our process of formation. We learn communication patterns, expectations, values, much of who we are, for better or for worse, can trace itself back to our family of origin. If you ever took the Emotionally Healthy Discipleship course, which we offered here for several years, you might recall a phrase that came up often, which is, Jesus may be in your heart, but Grandpa is in your bones. (laughs) And it's very accurate. Uh, We come to faith in Jesus, and we're excited, and God begins a work of transforming us, but then we begin to hit these walls of, of, of discovering things about ourselves that maybe we tried to ignore or gloss over, but they're there, and God wants to address them. He wants to heal those places in our lives. But I digress. Families are complicated. If you had to choose a few words to describe your family of origin, what would they be? And I recognize that, again, asking that question can stir up a lot of different feelings. And so I asked that question with compassion, and with empathy. But if you had to choose just a few words to capture the essence of your family of origin, what might those words be? In other words, what are the (coughs) qualities that mark your family, setting it apart from other families? What mark did your family leave upon you? In what ways is grandpa still in your bones to this day? Now we look at Ephesians through this lens of the new family of Jesus which I think is a helpful lens for looking at it through. Um, We discover a number of things that we'll be exploring together over the coming weeks. Now, Paul, who wrote this letter, was a Jew by birth. Speaking of families, his origin story begins in the Jewish world. And he here is writing to a community of Jesus followers in Ephesus who were a mix of Jesus following Jews and Jesus following Gentiles people coming from very different families of origin, very different starting points. And in this letter, he's encouraging them to understand the meaning and the practices of being members of a new family, this new family of Jesus. 
Consider for another moment Paul's own starting point. He was, when we first meet him, Saul, a faithful, devoted member of the family he considered to be his primary source of identity, Judaism. And he went to great lengths to protect his family from his, the perceived threat of the Jesus movement. Paul, Saul at that time, as we know, was one who relentlessly persecuted and sought out Christians, throwing many of them in prison and perhaps doing much, much worse. Until that moment when he collided with Jesus on the road to Damascus and realized in that moment and what followed that the family he had been devoting himself to, protecting for all of his life, was not what he thought it was. And this began his entry into the new family of Jesus. His entry, in some ways, was not unlike a natural birth. It was traumatic. It was disorienting. It shaped, ultimately, the trajectory of Paul's future. His life was different from that point on. Radically, radically different. And why Ephesians? Why take this time to explore Ephesians and to look at it through this lens of the new family of Jesus? Allow me to share just a few thoughts uh, as a way of introduction before digging a little more specifically into today's passage. In a time of cultural divisiveness, Paul highlights in his letter to the Ephesians the unifying power of the gospel of Jesus. The gospel, in other words, creates a new family from formerly fractured peoples. Uh, in the, the broad sense, Jews and Gentiles, but I'm sure there are more complex layers beneath those two broader categories. Uh, consider, if you will, for a moment, who made their way into Jesus' own entourage. Seated around the table with Jesus were zealots, political radicals who wanted to overthrow the Roman occupiers, tax collectors who had aligned themselves with the Roman occupiers. You can imagine the conversations around those dinner tables. Fishermen, at times prostitutes, wealthy women who supported the ministry of Jesus, and even at times Pharisees. That's a complex lot of people gathering together around one table. Imagine there are many stories that didn't make their way into the Gospels about the things that happened around those tables, the way these siblings kicked each other under the table, or poked fun at each other, or, or found ways to, to name call, or, or even at times uh, just had pent up anger and outright hostility towards one another. Or perhaps this brings to mind some memories from your own childhood around the family table as you taunted and teased your siblings, or in my case, kicked my sisters under the table, trying my best to uh, send them off in anger, which usually landed me at the kitchen counter for the rest of the meal. Many, many, many times that happened. I have long legs. What are you supposed to do with them under a small table? The options are very limited. But these people who gathered together under Jesus and this new family he was forming were complex people from very different starting points, very different families of origin, if you will. And yet they found themselves uniting under one family name, the name of Jesus. And there are similar dynamics with the people that Paul is writing to in Ephesians. You have these two people groups who are coming together and trying to figure out what does it mean to be the new family of Jesus? Do you have to practice our cultural customs or ours? Do you have to go to Christmas at my mom's house or your mom's house? How does this all work? All the complexities when we start merging families into one. Ephesians addresses core practices of the family of Jesus in living out the gospel. In other words, there is a distinct way of life in this family. And so we'll see throughout the chapters to follow Paul talking about things like unity in diversity or unity in our submission to one another as we are all submitting to Christ as the head of the family. Or we'll get towards the end of his letter to the Ephesians, Paul talking about focusing our energy and effort to fight the right battle. He uses the language of the spiritual armor of God to focus us on where our energy and effort really should be directed, not at fighting one another, but at fighting something much deeper and larger. And why is this all relevant to us? Well, we live in a time of cultural divisiveness. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I have, and perhaps you have as well. This year is an election year, which means there's gonna be some interesting things popping up on our social media streams and our news feeds. And we're going to have decisions to make as the people of Jesus. How do we respond and interact with those? Are we going to be people who sling mud at one another or sling mud at those who disagree with us? 
Or are we going to be something different? Who are we going to be in the midst of this time of cultural divisiveness? As a people who follow a Jesus who brings people together, people from very, very different backgrounds. This is relevant to us uh, because we find ourselves often getting tangled up in these decisions of what side should we take in a matter. And there are times when we should take a side. But there are often times we find ourselves taking sides that perhaps is not what our calling is as followers of Jesus. And perhaps there are more times where we should be asking questions like, how do I live as a member of the new family of Jesus in an era of division? It was Jesus himself who said, blessed are the peacemakers. What are the implications of those words from Jesus for you and for me today in a culture that is divided? Is it for us to be a divided people as well? Or is it for us to bring something different into the mix? Why else is this relevant to us? Well, Ephesus, when Paul arrives, was a place of significant religious pluralism. It was a complex metropolis, if you will, uh, that included Judaism. When Paul first arrives to Ephesus, there is a synagogue that he goes to and begins his teaching ministry and sharing the good news of Jesus, as he often did when he made his way to a new town. But that's not the only force that's at work in the city of Ephesus. At the time Paul arrives, the primary Roman deity worship there was Artemis. And there were at least 50 other gods, including Zeus and Athena, who were also regularly worshipped. You can start to get a sense of the, the complexity of this cultural landscape. It was a city where there were places of learning. Paul goes to a location called the Hall of Tyrannus. And it was likely a place where philosophy was discussed and debated, where intelligent minds came together to discuss what seemed to be important to them. And Paul goes there and engages in those debates, but bringing with him something new, the gospel of Jesus. In this city, there were itinerant Jewish exorcists known as the sons of Sceva, who were kind of an interesting lot going around and doing things, and Paul runs into them as well. There was a man named Demetrius who was a silversmith who made shrines of Artemis, who becomes quite angry with Paul for his gospel ministry because he begins losing customers, and he raises a whole um, just group of people who become very, very angry with Paul, and a riot begins here in the city of Ephesus. And final layer, when Paul arrives, there are disciples, followers of Jesus there, but they have not yet heard of the Holy Spirit. The point is this, the place that Paul arrives to is complex. There's a lot going on. There are lots of competing and contending forces, and he comes in with this new message of Jesus, and people begin responding to it, coming out of these different walks of life, and now having to figure out what does it mean to be the new family of Jesus. So, with all that background said, let me turn our attention toward our primary text for today, which is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. Paul writes, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, don't get too excited. I'm not going to preach a message on predestination. Nathan asked me the other week if I would, and I'm not going there. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a great use of our time and energy to get tangled up in conversations about predestination and free will. I think there are more important matters for us to focus our time and attention on, although that word does pop up here. But where I want to focus our attention today is on verse 13, where Paul says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. The mark of the new family of Jesus is not biological, it is spiritual. It is not based upon ethnic identity, which is what Paul had known in the first part of his life, a, an identity that was rooted in his Judaism, that he could trace back through his genealogy. But the mark of the new family of Jesus is not a biological mark, it is a spiritual mark. As we hear in Paul's words, those who respond to the message of Jesus are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. 
This is the mark which identifies you as a part of the family of Jesus. Paul's words here, of course, echo Jesus' own words from John chapter 14, verses 18 through 21, where Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit who will be given to those who believe after his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus says the following, beginning in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans, using family language. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. That's the family way of life, the one who follows the way of Jesus, who practices the commands of Jesus. That's what the family culture looks like. But you are marked with the Holy Spirit. That is the sign that you are in the family. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So just a few thoughts on this seal of the Holy Spirit. First, a seal signifies belonging. A seal signifies belonging. Paul makes a similar statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 to these words he writes in Ephesians chapter 1. He states, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. God set his seal of ownership upon us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. And so in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, our text for today, he begins this letter with an assurance to them of their place in the new family of Jesus. The Holy Spirit has been given to you as a sign and a seal that you are part of this family. The gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us is God's way of saying, you are mine. That you belong to me. You belong to my family. In addition, the seal of the Holy Spirit at our time of conversion continues to work in us as we grow, becoming more and more like Jesus. So this mark that is given to us at our time of spiritual birth, God doesn't simply mark us and then move on to the next potential candidate for the family but God remains with us. And that seal, that mark of the Holy Spirit continues to work within us as we grow, becoming more and more like Jesus, taking on more and more of the qualities of the new family that we have been brought into. Pastor Eric Raymond on the Gospel Coalition blog writes the following about this. He writes, the Holy Spirit provides the inward assurance that we belong to God as children. By giving us the Holy Spirit, God seals or stamps us as his own at our conversion. And then the Holy Spirit continues to testify, continues to to stir within us, to work within us, authenticating the reality of this relationship by making us more and more like Jesus. As much as we might want to deny it, there is a reality to the fact that we, as we grow, adopt many of the practices of our own parents. We may prefer not to, and there are some that we might need to learn our way out of because they weren't healthy, but there are many ways in which we begin to reflect our parents as we grow. There's a similar dynamic here. As we grow in this new family of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the seal which was given to us at our time of birth, remains within us and works within us over time, transforming us so that we look more and more like the head of the family. That is Jesus. Now let's talk about conversion for a moment because that word came up in this point. Conversion is that point or process in which our faith becomes real and we are marked as one of God's own. Now note that I said point or process. Sometimes we believe that conversion has to be a distinct moment. A distinct moment in time that we can point back to and say that was the moment that I met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and from that point on, everything was different. And yes, Paul had that experience, but that is not everyone's experience. Consider, if you will, the story of Peter. Uh, J.R. Briggs, who was with us a few weeks ago in his book, The Sacred Overlap, writes the following about Peter. He writes, if someone asked you when Peter became a Christian, what would you tell them? What would you say? Some say it happened when Jesus called him to fish for men. 
on the rocky shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Maybe. Others offer that it was at the end of Mark chapter 8 when Peter answered Jesus' pointed question, who do you say that I am with you are the Christ? Maybe that was the moment. Others point to when Jesus restored Peter after he had denied him three times. Some are convinced that it was not until after the resurrection when Peter ran to the tomb and found it empty. Still others argue it happened at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended. So what's the answer? We don't know for sure, but it seems clear that Jesus discipled his disciples long before they actually became Christians. And the point is this. There may be a distinct moment that you can point to as your moment of conversion, or your conversion may have been a gradual process over time as you are coming closer and closer to Jesus. Neither way is better than the other, and there are plenty of examples of both. And to our earlier point, Jesus continued to disciple Peter as the Holy Spirit had taken up residence within him. We see this in the book of Acts as Peter's story unfolds. There are new things that Peter does, things he's continuing to learn, ways in which the Holy Spirit is shifting Peter's perspective as the mission of Jesus goes from Jerusalem and begins to spread out to the world around. The seal of the Holy Spirit at our time of conversion or through our process of conversion continues to work within us as we grow, becoming more and more like Jesus. And so as we consider this letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians, and in these opening chapters, we're going to be reflecting on the message of the gospel before we get into the final three chapters, which talk about how we live out the gospel. What is the gospel of Jesus doing? And through this lens of the new family of Jesus, I would frame it this way. The gospel of Jesus is God's great story of people like you and me going home. Earlier in Ephesians chapter one, Paul writes the following in verses eight through 10. With all wisdom and understanding, he, that is God, made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will is that the Messiah was not just for the Jewish people, but the Messiah was for all people. It was at an origin point, the arrival of Jesus came into an origin point into one particular family, the Jewish family, but the Messiah was meant for all. That's the mystery of God's will. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Another way we might say it is to bring everything home again. Tim Mackey of the Bible Project says it well and and in a simpler way that was helpful to me. God's plan was to always have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus, the Messiah. God's plan, this is what was predestined, was to always have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus, the Messiah. So what is the gospel of Jesus doing? Well, consider the symmetry of the biblical narrative. It's quite profound and beautiful. The problem, as the story tells us, began with a man, Adam, who leaves his home because of unfaithfulness. The solution also is initiated with a man, Abram, who leaves his home as an act of faithfulness. That solution that begins with Abram's departure from his home as an act of faithfulness climaxes with another man, Jesus, who leaves his home and comes to us. And that solution concludes as we, humans, in Jesus, find our way home. The gospel of Jesus is God's great story of people like you and me coming home to our true family. And that is good news. That is good news if you come from a family of origin that is broken, dysfunctional, and abusive. That is also good news if you come from a family of origin that was healthy and warm and loving. Because this family is our true home, our true family. As much as we might love and cherish our earthly families and cling to them and and work with all of our effort and energy and resources to make this 
perfect family experience, there's still something in the deep places of our heart that says there's got to be more because there is more. The family of Jesus is the one that we're called to. And so it's no surprise to me that Jesus used stories like the story of a son who returns to his father after being lost. Or that when he reached out and healed, he called people daughter, an expression of love and intimacy. As we journey through Ephesians together over the coming months, I want to put before you a few core questions to consider. At this time, I'll invite the worship team to come forward because we'll close in a song in a moment. The first question is this. What is the definition of the church that you have adopted and the corresponding expectations? And with that, the second question, is God inviting you to understand the church through a fresh lens? And how does this phrase, the new family of Jesus, inform that lens? How does this idea shape the way we think about what it is that we're doing here right now? I think there's more than simply a a number of people who are strangers coming and filling some chairs and engaging in a worship experience and then departing. I think there's a deeper reality that's meant to be at play here. And it's up to us whether we tap into that or not or keep things at a surface level. So what is the definition of the church that you have adopted and the corresponding expectations? Is God inviting you to understand the church through a fresh lens? And how does this phrase, the new family of Jesus, inform that lens? And finally, friends, what is the specific invitation that God is extending to you as you consider the nature of his church, of his family, and your place in it? Maybe today the invitation that God is putting before you is to respond for the first time, to his invitation to come and be a part of his family, to trust him with your life, to respond to that call that you are mine and and to be marked with his spirit within you. Maybe God is inviting you this morning to truly see things through a new lens and in light of that to engage differently in your faith and your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. What is the specific invitation that God is putting before you today as you consider the nature of his family and your place in it? He welcomes you into his family. He calls you by name. He longs for you to be a part of that family. And so may we respond. Will you join me in prayer? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of You're welcome. You are a God of of deep, deep welcome. We come from many different starting points. And many of those starting points are are so very broken, so painful. God, you come to us in compassion, with empathy, with mercy, and with love. And you say, come. Be my child, be my son, be my daughter. Come and take a seat at my dining table. Be a part of my family. God, we thank you that there is a place for us. No matter what we have done, no matter what has been done to us, there is a place for us in your household. As we journey through this letter to the Ephesians, May we understand how it speaks into our lives today. And may we understand how to respond and have the courage to do so. God, we thank you for the gift of your invitation. Help us to respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us in this song that we're going to sing as a response to the words we just heard.
to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down. And I My soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Son for redemption, the price for my heart. And I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend all. Father 
Friends, let's join together in our common commission before we go forth. Will you join with me? Let's now go forth into the world in peace, being of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, rendering to no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all persons, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, my friends, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. And as you go from this place, may you go with assurance that the seal of the Holy Spirit has been placed upon you through your faith in Jesus Christ, that you are a member of his family. And if you have not made the decision to trust your life into Jesus' hands, may this be your moment. May you respond, and may you have the same assurance that God is indeed with you. Friends, as you go from this place, may you go, knowing that God goes before you, that he goes with you and behind you, and God will be with you always. May you trust in him. Amen. Amen. There's coffee down to my left. Help yourselves. God bless you. We'll see you all next week. <clears throat>